Perspective Shift, Unveiling Paradigms and Perceptions Navigating Christian doctrines can be overwhelming. Returning to biblical interpretation is vital for clarity and unity. Shifting perspectives to align with the Word of God brings authenticity to our faith. Let's seek truth together with open hearts and minds. Perspective Shift with Dare Akinsanya Hello everyone, my name is Daria Kinsoya and welcome to this week's Soul Nourishing episode. Last week we zeroed in on the undisputable truth that nothing is too hard for God to do. And we established the fact that the call to walking in faith is a simple call to wholeheartedly rely on God. We also clarified that faith is simple but not simplistic. Being simplistic is tantamount to leading an irresponsible lifestyle where we fold our hands in a hopeless surrender in the name of casting our burden on Jesus. For example, if we are hungry, the responsible thing to do is get off the couch, head to the kitchen and cook ourselves some food. It is irresponsible to sit there on the couch and be commanding angels to appear mystically and cook the food and dish it out even. God offers help when we are in situations beyond our control, but He does not condone laziness. This week, we are looking at what Jesus did after He demonstrated His total trust in God. Of course, He didn't just fold His arms in hopeless surrender. Rather, he did five significant things instead which are listed in our anchor scripture for this episode. From Matthew 14 verse 19. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. And here is insight number 10. Transformative power of thanksgiving. The steps Jesus took are significant and demonstrates to us how he expects us to respond in similar circumstances. Let's settle some facts before dissecting the five steps he took. The indisputable foundation for godly lifestyle is trust in God or faith in God. Knowing that whatever situation we find ourselves as believers that God knows about it already and He has our back at all times because of His unconditional love for us. When we recognize this, it helps us recognize that He will never mismanage our trust in Him. If God allows any situation to happen to us, we can be rest assured that the situation we are encountering is a negotiated option that He knows we can bear. He doesn't just equip us to bear it. He also makes a way out even before the trial hits us. If we know and believe this, we will naturally be grateful to Him for always having our best desires at heart. Trust is the bedrock of relationships. Best friends know themselves and that knowledge builds trust between them. The more we know God and understand Him, the more our trust in Him grows. When we know that He has already provided to us every resource that we will ever need for a turnaround, it will influence our gratitude towards Him, even while in the midst of a storm. Jesus didn't complain about the meager resource that was handed to him. Rather, he gave thanks for it despite the fact. Because he knows God well and there is a mutual trust between them. He also knew that the five loaves and two fishes came from God because a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. As documented in John 3.27, someone may ask, if trust is the bedrock of love, why doesn't God trust all humans? Great question. Trust is the bedrock of relationships, which is fueled by conditional or natural love. C.W. Lewis described four kinds of love. 
This include philia, which is brotherly love or friendship, storage, which is love between family members, eros, which is sensual love or romantic love between couples, and agape, which is unconditional love. The first three require trust to thrive, but the fourth one, agape, does not require anything whatsoever because it has no condition. So technically, there are only two kinds of love, conditional love, which is or natural love, and unconditional love, which is supernatural love. Only God is able to constantly love anything unconditionally without wavering. Hence, trust is the bedrock of conditional love, and the love that God has for us is unconditional, so trust has no part in that equation. He therefore can only trust us based on how much we love and obey Him. Again, our trust in Him or lack of it thereof does not influence His love for us in any way. It, however, determines how we relate with Him and how He relates with us. In other words, when we know and understand God to certain extents, we will naturally be grateful to him because we know what he constantly does on our behalf. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 Rejoice always, pray without season. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Fulfilling God's will gives him pleasure. And we identified in the last episode that faith is at the core of the things that give God pleasure. Faith is also evident in thanksgiving, which means an ungrateful heart is a heart that is devoid of faith. Now let's address the importance and power of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a vital aspect of a believer's life. Offering profound benefits and spiritual growth, it is not merely an expression of gratitude, but a powerful act that aligns us with God's will and releases His blessings in our lives. It also helps stabilize our mind when in a storm, knowing that the situation is a lesser evil that was negotiated on our behalf. In case someone is thinking, why doesn't God just overrule the devil instead of negotiating a lesser trial? Great question. We must recognize that God is a just God, and He is not a respecter of anyone. He formed the universe and set it to run on a simple principle of seed time and harvest as recorded in Genesis 8.22. The devil, however, is our accuser and he can only accuse us based on evidences that he has about us. God cannot ignore those evidences that Satan presents to him which will make him unjust. Rather, he negotiates a lower sentence based on our capabilities. That's why the Bible says no temptation has overtaken us except that which is common to man. And it, it continues that with the temptation, God makes a way out that we may be able to bear it. Satan does not miss a beat. He will exploit every opportunity that he gets. He is always searching for loopholes to accuse us with, which means we cannot afford to let our guards down. This, of course, is a major topic on its own, so I'll let it rest at this juncture and continue with the importance of Thanksgiving. Number one, thanksgiving as worship. Thanksgiving is a form of worship that acknowledges God's goodness and sovereignty in our lives or in the universe. Worship is a ticket to entering into his presence. Psalms 100 verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Thanksgiving and worship is our way of observing heavenly hello protocol. We can imagine a visitor showing up at our doorstep without saying a hello. A lack of thanksgiving can strain our relationship with God likewise. 
as it shows a lack of appreciation of his continuous grace and mercy. Luke 17 verses 17 and 18. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? The text in that verse shows that God actually expects our thanksgiving. Number two, thanksgiving brings peace. Expressing gratitude shifts our focus from problems to God's provision, bringing peace to our hearts. In Paul's encouragement to the Philippians in chapter 4, he told them, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let their requests be known to God. In other words, thanksgiving helps us maintain a peaceful nature which is kind of guarding our hearts from wandering alta skelter everywhere and stay focused on God. And number three, gratitude promotes physical health. Everyone wants to be healthy, otherwise no one will ever seek for a cure or recovery from sickness. In the book of Proverbs, the Bible says, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. The merry heart in there is synonymous to a heart of gratitude, while the broken spirit is synonymous to ingratitude. If we analyze gratitude and ingratitude, we will find that at the core lies the gain or loss of something that we appreciate so much. We are normally grateful when we feel we have something and ingratitude sets in when we can't get something or when we lose something. I used to live by the principle to expect nothing so that I am not disappointed if nobody does anything for me until the Holy Spirit helped me to realize the power of expectation with respect to receiving harvests. I have changed that now and expect everything with the mindset that no one owes me anything however. So when someone does something, I am still truly grateful and when no one does anything, the consciousness that they owe me nothing helps set disappointment at bay. Consequently, failing to thank God can lead to a lack of spiritual awareness and dullness. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he warned them that although they knew God, they did not glorify Him, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, Paul attributed lack of gratitude to be an act of foolishness. And number four, thanksgiving leads to multiplication and this is where we are zeroing on tonight. Thanksgiving precedes miracles and multiplication. This is what Jesus demonstrated in the feeding of the multitudes. He gave thanks for the loaves and fish and demonstrated how gratitude can unlock divine increase. Without recognizing God's provision, we may miss out on further blessings and opportunities for growth. Lack of gratitude can also hinder blessings. In Malachi 2, God said to the Israelites, so because they will not hear and because they will not take it to heart to give God the glory that is due to his name, he said he will send a curse upon them and it will cause their blessing. He said, in fact, I have cursed them already because they refuse to take it to heart to give glory unto God. While writing the book, Yes and Amen, the Holy Spirit helped me realize the reason why God wants us to be thankful at all times. The underlying message is that we would naturally be grateful if a gunshot that should have killed someone only bruised their ears. The bruising of the ears is not a good thing, but when compared to the fatal alternative, which is the devil's original plan, 
we cannot but fall on our knees and give gratitude to God. In Exodus 13, 17 and 18, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. We can imagine the number of wars the Israelites had to fight on that path that God said was the better route, that they would not turn back when faced with severe opposition. They actually almost turned back and told Moses that he should have left them in Egypt. We can now imagine the magnitude of the adversity God prevented them from if he had led them through the shorter path. This makes more sense when we study the conversation between God and Satan before Job's ordeal. Job 1, 8 through 12. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely cause you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. With that said, it is pertinent to hear from the horse's mouth the things that actually led to his own ordeal. In Job chapter 3 verse 25, he said, For the things that I greatly feared has come upon me, and the things that I dreaded has happened to me. In other words, fear and dread are powerful forces of expectation that can make things manifest. Job used his own imagination to meditate his dreaded calamities into fruition. God, however, continued to mount a hedge of protection around him regardless until Satan exploited the loophole in his life. At the end of the conversation, God allowed Satan, being a just God, to touch Job, but prevented Satan from unleashing the full weight of his arsenal on Job. Without knowing what God has done on his behalf, of course, Job launched into a grievance galore and accused God in all manner of ways that he could think of until God sat him down and questioned him. Job eventually realized he was wrong and judged God to be faithful after all. Job 42, 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. All this boils down to the fact that if we know the alternative God prevented us from, <laughs> which is the devil's original intention, we will remain grateful for whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. Of course, this is easier said than done. It takes constant medication on God's word and experiences that we get from walking with him that empowers us to live a life of gratitude. With all of that clarified, 
Here are the five sequential actions that Jesus took and their significance from that Matthew 14, 19. The first one is that he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, meaning he maintained a calm state of mind. He knows this is not a time to stir up pandemonium. We'll address this in detail in the next episode, but you know we want to hone on in the to the fact that he consciously chose to maintain decorum despite the existing challenge and number two is he took the five loaves and the two fish that is he accepted whatever they presented to him we address this in detail in insight number five. You can go back and check it out from episode six. He did not despise the resource that was handed over to him. And the third one is that he looked up to heaven because he recognized that the way out is not in his ability, but in God's ability. We touched on this also in insight number one from episode two. He recognized that he is only a conduit and God is the source. Number four, the Bible says he blessed and broke. He blessed and broke. So rather than complain, he was grateful for what he received and by so doing, blessed it. This means that when we complain about a resource, we are technically cursing them. It is only things that are blessed that grow. The ones that are cursed merely withers and die off. And the fifth one, according to the Bible, he gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So after executing the prerequisites, he now then launched out in faith by putting the resource in his hands to work. We should realize that he could have asked God to send quail or manna like in the days of Moses, but he wanted to demonstrate to us how to address any resource that we may consider to be insufficient. We, of course, are not expected to just fold our hands in hopeless surrender to God in the name of turning our yoke into God's hand, but to work our salvation out in faith. That is, apply actions to the things that we believe. As a round of this episode tonight, it is important to know that thanksgiving is a powerful tool for believers and it leads to spiritual growth, peace, and divine multiplication. It opens the door to God's presence and blessings, while ingratitude results in spiritual decline and missed opportunities. The transformative power of thanksgiving cannot be repudiated and it goes both ways with respect to whether we adopt it or jettison it. The key to experiencing God's blessing and multiplication lies in recognizing and utilizing what He already gave us. So let us strive to cultivate a thankful heart, recognizing that though we cannot thank God enough, our continuous gratitude brings us closer to Him and aligns us with his will. I pray tonight that God grants us the grace to live a lifestyle of gratitude, that no matter what circumstance that we find ourselves, that his praise will never leave our mouth. Like Job says, even though he slays me, yet will I trust him. The grace to trust God may God grant to us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And with that, we have come to the end of today's episode. As always, I look forward to your feedback and comments. Please keep them coming still. 
please visit or connect with me at akinsd.com forward slash podcast or via the podcast channel on YouTube. I hope that this has been of some value to you and I want to thank you for listening. Have a great week ahead and remember, Jesus is not of all. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Thank you.